Hi, I'm your host, Johnny Wilkinson, and welcome to this episode of I Am. I had the opportunity to talk to the brilliant Dr. Mitu Steroni this week, and I got to cover loads of exciting new ground on the subject of potential. Her knowledge, her passion, her research was so powerful for me and helped me to obtain lots of interesting scientific takes for what I've been experiencing on a personal level, but also for the general concept of growth too. And if you want to hear more, then do head over to the Tuesday episode just before this one. These Thursday episodes are just for the guests though. I feel they have so much to offer, so much possibility and opportunity in what they're they're, they're talking about, what they've been through. So I don't want to waste any more time on me. Thanks so much for listening. I am Johnny Wilkinson. This is the I Am Podcast with Mitu Steroni. Dr. Mitu Steroni, a real pleasure. Thank you so much for being here on my I Am Podcast. It's a real privilege. I can't wait to get into some of the stuff we're going to talk about, particularly around stress, and you'll get so much of your knowledge on that. But I'd also like to uh, know, first of all, how are you? Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very well, thank you. So... I'm really keen to get you delving deep into to what you know and, and challenge you with a few ideas that come from my side. But uh, first of all, just to lay the ground foundations in a way, what is your speciality? What's your background and, and how come you're, you're doing what you do right now? So my background begins with medicine. So I trained as a physician and then I specialized in the eyes and then I specialized in the part of the brain that deals with the eyes. And really that means the brain overall, because there are very few conditions that affect the brain that actually don't affect the eyes. And it's called neuro-ophthalmology. And I did quite a lot of neuroscience research as part of that and throughout my training. And that really made me very, very interested in the brain And my most recent milestone has been writing a book called Stress Proof, which I wrote from the perspective of both a physician, but also as a person who's very stressed, and also as as a researcher trying to look at all the research and turn the idea of stress into something more tangible rather than just an abstract, defeatist concept that people can work on. That's really cool. The I Am podcast is all about potential. And I think stress has a huge role to play in that, but not just on the negative side, because stress for me is really interesting in a way that it's almost in some respects become a kind of marker for one's importance in life is how much you're stressing. To a degree, it's it's almost been a kind of example to set. I know when I was playing rugby, sometimes coaches would bring other people's attention to my face when we're on the bus on the way to the game to be like, yeah, there's a real professional. Look how little enjoyment is going on there. You know, look how on the edge that person is. Look how completely lost in their own world that person is. And it, it seems strange for me that that would be the case, but maybe from a societal perspective, as you said, it almost seems to be an absolute truth to life that you have to get stressed if you're working, if you're doing certain kinds of things. I'd like to get into that. You mentioned about your research. How is the the world of awareness in stress sort of moving? Are people becoming more aware of it? How do people feel about it in, in your opinion? Well, first, the perception of stress and the understanding of what stress is. So stress is very simply an adaptation gap. It's what your brain does to create a bridge to seal the adaptation gap between where it thinks you are and where it thinks you need to be. So that's very simply what stress is. When you talk about stress being a badge of honor and being a sign of people, especially high achievers, doing what they're doing, it makes perfect sense because achievement is in some ways, a form of adaptation achievement. So when you have a challenge, there is a bar between where you are and where that challenge is going to take you. And that bar or that gap is what you need to bridge. And on a day-to-day existence level, one of the, the main things that the brain does is allows us to adapt, to deal with our surroundings, but perhaps more importantly, to bring the world around us under our control. And throughout evolution, this bringing the world under our control has involved getting food, not getting eaten, surviving. But as we have made the world more and more complex, more and more artificial, 
the demands of the world have fallen out of line with the demands of evolution. The world is changing at a faster pace than we are able to adapt to it. And that is creating an adaptation gap. And when the brain sees this adaptation gap, it pushes a button that mobilizes a kind of a default set of programs that allows you the maximal chance of adaptation and hence survival blindly, no matter what the challenge is. So that is a stress response. And as a society, especially in developed countries, not so much in, you know, in tribal communities, hunter-gatherer communities where things still carry on as they were, but certainly in our industrialized, urbanized ways of living, there are constantly more and more of these adaptation gaps. And the brain is pushing down on the stress button to desperately make ourselves adapt to it. A short bout of stress bridges that gap gets you to your destination. But if you keep the button pressed down, all these resources that your brain is mobilizing, they have non-linear effects. So they work to your benefit in the short term, they start causing harm in the long term. And as a society, we are noticing that in a general, you know, day-to-day life, a great many people are in these situations of chronic stress without being aware of it. And this manifests in ways that are not classical. They manifest as the development of chronic disease, the worsening of existing inflammatory conditions, and so on and so forth. And I think this understanding is gradually taking place as clinicians are now able to measure certain markers, biomarkers for chronic stress. And hence, we can finally put a label to it and recognize this enormous problem. That's really, really, really interesting. If I look at myself, I guess I see two types of stress. One that's a very clear, engaged experience of the stress. And that sends me towards the more primal survival physical stress. And then there's the mind-based stress. And I, I wonder with you what you're talking about in bridging that gap and us leading the direction of that gap a bit as a society. Is it that we are therefore directing our own adaptation with the kind of endeavors we're following in life, you know, technological advancement, financial views of success, status, respect, all these kind of things that maybe have more of an external feel to them. Are we in danger of adapting ourselves to fit that purpose? This is a very important point. Let's break it down. So, One of the the very basic reactions or needs we have is the need to be an agent in our world. What that means is to feel as though you are pulling the strings of the puppet that's the world around you, not the other way around. So you have this great big thing called the prefrontal cortex, which uh, differentiates you from your great, great, great ancestors. It's both a an advantage and an enormous disadvantage because you imagine a world, an existence, and a possibility, and the possibility of an absence of control and danger without it even existing. And the limit of your imagination in that sense can cause the limit of your stress response. So if you have unbounded imagination, that shows you how unbounded your imagination of the unknown can be. Now, what is interesting with, with when we link the two together is this need for us to bring our environment under control comes from what recent research has suggested, which is that at any moment in time, your brain is blind to the world around you. And it is simply using the cues it is getting from the world to create an imaginary model of what it thinks the world looks like. If there is a mismatch between this model, as in what it expects to find and what it actually finds, that causes anxiety, that causes fear, that causes uncertainty, and it triggers a stress response. So really, very basically, this need to control is incredibly important, to be an agent in the world. Now, 
when you move from your changing room to the pitch, a very interesting interplay happens. And there is a new um, line of neuroscience research that, or theory, that proposes that rather than simply creating an image of the world, to an extent, the brain creates its reality based on a sort of resonance with the world which means that the feedback signal you're getting to and fro from the world shapes your moment-to-moment perception of safety, of reality, and of control. So when you are in the changing room beforehand, you are imagining what the pitch looks like. You're imagining what the crowd sound like. You're imagining what, what the dynamics of the game will be like. But once you are out there, the imagination need not exist. It has no time to exist. You are existing on a moment-to-moment basis of feedback response, feedback response, feedback response, which has become so perfectly honed that you almost become synchronous with the dynamics of the game. And that synchronicity gives you constant feedback, which gives you an illusion of control. So while your physiological arousal, the sort of hypervigilance, the noradrenergic circuits are at maximal play, they don't get tipped into stress any longer because of this feedback you're getting with the actual reality. And that's what keeps you in the perfect zone for maximal performance. Now, when you leave the pitch, reality melts away and your mind starts ruminating and imagining a new pitch and a new future and the next game. And that is where that interplay comes in. So coming to your second point about whether we are creating challenges and creating a an adaptation gap by the widespread use of technology, by the enormous change that we are bringing to our own constructed worlds. There's a very interesting 1960s media philosopher you may have heard of called Marshall McLuhan. And he says something which really rings true. He said that we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. And that is so incredibly true at the moment because when you are out there on a game To an extent, the challenge that you are setting yourself is perhaps far nearer to our evolution, to the evolutionary challenges that we had, compared to some of the challenges that we are creating through technology. So at the moment, we are creating a world where, first of all, work is moving from the hands to the mind, whether you talk about construction, whether you talk about flying a plane, and whether you talk about my field, eye surgery. More and more, work that used to be done by the hands is being done by the mind. The cognitive load is is becoming heavier and heavier and heavier. As soon as you start working under great cognitive load, your room for taking on additional pressure, additional stresses becomes narrower. So we are engineering a world where we're leaving very little flexibility to deal with sudden amplifications of uncertainty and stress and so on. And perhaps even more importantly, as our world becomes more and more virtual, we are using the same part of the brain that you use in that changing room before you go onto the pitch. And we are using it not because we are wondering what will happen next, not because we are trying to picture the future, but because almost every interaction right now is taking place in a virtual space, putting a great deal of load on our imagination. And if we exist within that realm, we are far more likely to imagine reality rather than experience it. And as I described before, as soon as you start living in an imaginary realm, your imagination sets the boundary for what frightens you, for your fears, for your boundaries. Wow, that's really cool. So here's one to throw in for the first part of that answer. Is there a link associated with the changing room work, the imagining the reality? Is there a link between the two in terms of how well we perform on the field is any way down to that work that's been done in the change room? Or is that work in the change room simply surviving the changing room in order to reach the field? I would say the first, 100%. So your imagination belongs to you. 
And if you have control over your imagination, you set the boundaries of what you imagine. And there is a great deal of data of incredible sport performance arising from rehearsal. There's even data out of the sporting realm. If you look at uh, brain rehabilitation after stroke, imagining a movement, even though you can't actually perform that movement, actually shows a visible improvement on your brain's connection. So it gives your brain an incentive to heal. So rehearsing something specific certainly gives you a huge advantage when you're meeting that for the first time. And great sporting geniuses such as yourself have this tendency to keep rehearsing, keep rehearsing, keep rehearsing. And that is why the moment you go on that field, you suddenly realize that your reality is well within the bounds of your imagined reality. And it suddenly becomes at one with you. You suddenly recognize the feedback and you respond to it. But in order for that to happen, you have had to imagine and go through every single possibility before walking out on that field. So preparation versus execution. So I completely agree in terms of my own personal experience. It corroborates what I'm essentially aware of. But there's an interesting part of this in that you mentioned about the unbound imagination. And I think as children, there is a greater, I think, representation of that. And as a result, for so much of the week when I was very young, all I could think of was rugby and all I could think of was how amazing everything was. When I got very close to the game, I'd get hit with all these kind of enormous anxiety or what have you, but just before the game more or less, the night before, day of, and I was, you know, as a very young child, I was often sick, you know, it was that kind of intensity. But then as I got a lot older, and as you could mention, far more experienced and professional and whatever these things might be, that period of anxiety extended way back to include pretty much the entire week. So that imagination that was unbound and going everywhere into the most marvellous spaces, and it was always imagination of wonder, what could happen, what might happen, had now still in place the entire week, but now the intensity was still there, but it was flipped on me as if to be like, what if this happens? So it had been a kind of survival versus an exploration so when I was younger I was exploring when I was older it was just pure need to control but there were some amazing incidences for example when I was younger where you'd turn up to a training session to see all your team on the field against another team and the coach runs over and says where where have you been we're playing a game today it's like oh no I thought we were training no it's a game get on the field and so you've got a minute and you run on the field and go "I'm, I'm not prepared and you play beautifully beyond anything you could ever imagine. And of course you passed it off as a fluke, but in fact, actually for me, there was an incredible lesson in that there was a huge amount of trusting that for me, I like to think of it as like that the future me will be prepared and equipped to deal with its future. Whereas this me is equipped to deal with my now. The only way to look after that future me is to give the future boundless opportunity. And if I feel like I'm taking anything away or I'm putting something on that future me's plate, that to me didn't represent great preparation. So if I was sort of essentially passing over this this kind of, or oh, watch out for this, you better watch out for this because this could go wrong, this could go wrong. It was in fact almost to invigorate and to energize that future me with nothing but just opportunity. So I'm really interested in the unbound imagination. Why as children do we seemingly have that imagination and why does it become bound when essentially I had the same set of circumstances around me as a child as I did as a, an older person? So let's break it down into three, three parts. Okay, so the first part is let's look at it in terms of your brain circuit. And this is not done often enough. And I think this is a very interesting angle to performance in general, getting into the zone and preventing the choking under pressure, which in your case, as a, as a world-class genius, is intense and in every direction. So let's break that down. When we talk about anxiety in the physiological sense, one aspect of of anxiety takes place along a spectrum of noradrenaline in the brain. And and I talk about noradrenaline, but it's important to remember that every, every neurotransmitter influences another. All right, so it's always not great to take one in isolation, but in this case I am because it helps uh, explain it. So 
when you're in a state of, of hyper vigilance and anxiety, your noradrenaline levels are incredibly high. You have a circuit in the brain that is pretty much switched off when you're asleep. It's at its maximum firing rate when you're in a state of anxiety before you've tipped into stress. All right. Stress happens after you tip into it. Now, when you talk about before the game and you're feeling sick, we'll come to the imagination aspect in just a second, but you're feeling sick. There's your physiological re response to it. What is happening is your brain's noradrenergic circuit, as an example, is going into fierce, fierce overdrive. And when it is in this state of hyper vigilance, you feel, you experience all the symptoms of anxiety. So you feel the, the, the nausea, you feel your heart racing, you feel dizzy, you feel as though your own self is no longer under your control, okay? If you were to curb that down by a notch or two, in some people by maybe a couple of notches, in other people by a single notch, you would enter into a zone where you are just vigilant enough, you are responsive enough without that tip into feeling sick. So you are just hyper alert, you're hyper vigilant, but not too much. And that reduction from the state of anxiety to the state of peak performance happens when you control your uncertainty. And in your case, I would guess that you're controlling your uncertainty by going onto the pitch and having to rely on immediate real feedback. So when you describe that that time when you thought you were rehearsing, but it was a real game, but you had no time to think. So you went there and you started playing. And as soon as you started playing, all those expected rehearsed situations started becoming lived experience. That created a feedback to tell you, you are right, your measurements are correct, you are in synchrony, you've got this. And that reduces you from being in a state of high anxiety into peak performance. That's one angle of it. The second angle of it, you talk about imagination. Now, it is true that when you're a child, one thing I really like to, to use as an analogy is the older we grow, there is this trade-off between wonder and wisdom. When you're very young, the absence of wisdom is in a way the absence of knowing danger signals, of knowing what's the worst that can happen. When you're a six-year-old or five-year-old kicking a ball, you don't really understand about contracts. You don't understand about reputation. You don't really care about the audience's expectation of you. For you, it's all wonder. It's not the wisdom of the negative result. So there is that trade-off, which we unfortunately have as we grow up. We should try not to have it. You know, there's a great quote that being a great adult is actually learning how to be a child again. So that wisdom wonder trade-off is part of the reason why you become more attuned to a negative outcome as you grow older compared to when you're a child. But we all have a different setting for what's called uncertainty intolerance, UI, intolerance of uncertainty. Intolerance of uncertainty is a very reliable marker for a large group of people with anxiety. So many people with anxiety, in fact, have a very high intolerance of uncertainty. This is actually measurable, and there are several papers on this. And the reason why they don't tolerate uncertainty is not because they are weak, but because many of these people have a bias towards a negative outcome. So many people with, with excessive anxiety, and you could, you know, when I say excessive anxiety, I don't mean pathological anxiety. I just mean people who react to situations. What's the worst that can happen? Someone else will say, oh, there's a 50 50 chance this can happen. For someone with intolerance of un uncertainty, anxiety, they will think, if this happens, that's just the worst case scenario. That can never happen. All right. So it's just a bias, a negativity bias. 
And I would guess that in some people like yourself, it can be harnessed to use as an extra motivational power to prevent that negative outcome from happening. So for instance, if you have a negativity bias and a high intolerance of the uncertainty of possibly losing or possibly not performing, you will spend every single moment when you are not performing to reduce the likelihood of the negative outcome. And you will spend way longer than the next person, way, way longer than the average person doing that. And by doing that, given your own performance in the pitch, to an extent, is something you can control. Now, the game, not so much, but certainly your own performance is something you can control. You know that by practice, you can significantly lower the chances of a negative outcome within the boundaries of your own control. And so you will try 10 times, 100 times as hard as someone who does not have that uncertainty intolerance. And so in your case, yes, it backfired when you were excessively anxious, when you were sick before a game, it put your body through a lot and your mind through a lot. But it's also possible that it is this that drove you to prepare so much that by the time you went onto the pitch, you got such a enormous kind of a positive feedback signal that everything is just as you expect. And every action is producing exactly the outcome you anticipated because you've put in these hours and hours of thinking and imagination and practice in order to reduce or eliminate the chance of a negative outcome. You mentioned that tipping point. And it's really interesting because I think that tipping point is also between wisdom and wonder, I think is also finding that tipping point there where there's enough wisdom and there's enough wonder. And I think for me, you mentioned about people's sort of certain setting on the the, the uncertainty, their kind of tolerance of the uncertainty or intolerance of, of uncertainty. And I think for me, that wisdom was almost taking too much notice of certain things, as you mentioned, to pick out the the negative of something where there's so much positive and hone in on that negative. And that also for me being a classic when I was you know younger in terms of my reactivity to something that hasn't gone right was to dwell on it and stay in it and keep bringing it back up. Even though it was in the past and nothing could be done, it was almost like there, there was something in it. I had to keep investigating and exploring and all these kind of things. And as a result, almost created that momentum in that direction of speeding up wisdom away from wonder, but also have to question when I hear wisdom, I think of something which opens up. You think of the wisdom that comes from gurus. It's like one comment opens up fields of opportunity. Whereas what I'm talking about is a lot of words that are reducing space. They're reducing space. I wouldn't even call it wisdom as so much. Just a tendency and a habit to simply, as you say, almost try to remove uncertainty with with guarantee. So to have no confidence, no respect or joy or reverence of the unknown but to actually remove that through training and preparation what it did with that reinforcement is what i say it was it was an aging process that's what it represented to me it was moving from wonder to wisdom was an aging process because the wisdom wasn't i think wisdom makes you younger if it's the right wisdom but my wisdom was making me feel older and it sped up the end of my career undoubtedly because i just I just got fed up with that kind of lifestyle. Whereas what I was after was beauty and flow and surprise and joy. And those things come out of the unknown. So I I, I coach others now. And I, I kind of was able to coach myself towards the end of my career, where, which was successful in, in sort of many ways that I wasn't able to be earlier on when I actually won things. And it was about repositioning that relationship with the unknown is to say well hold on imagine you get to see a video of the game you're about to play and you get to see everything you do and you see it's all perfect in fact it's amazing and you get to see it and feel it and therefore you know it all and then you say right now go and play and you'd say i i don't want to why not because there's nothing there for me it's like yes that's the point and the other point about the uncertainty being that going out there with this idea of invincibility around 
the concept that if it goes for me, great, it's a great feeling. If it goes against my wishes, there's so much opportunity to learn and grow. I'll be better than if it goes for me. So you're now in an invincibility perspective of saying, I don't care, let's just go do it. As long as I'm open and aware. But I think the point being is that the amount of time that I spent reacting was just reinforcing what I didn't want. And I guess some of that stuff where people say, you just got to, it's not great advice the way it's phrased or where necessarily in the energy it's, it's translated, but you just got to get on with it. But it, it is almost the case saying that the, the less time you spend reacting, the more time you spend responding. And that actually, does this really finish me when it doesn't go well? No. Okay, well, then that becomes my habit of almost handing that on to the future me to say, you know what, it isn't going to matter. Whereas the, what I was handing on to the future me was saying, it really matters. And the future me was saying, it does, doesn't it? I'll pass that on as well. And I'm wondering, when, with all your research, yeah, how does this affect that uncertainty? Are there things that can be easily reversed with certain practices? And how does it all tie in with this sort of psychiatric or psychological space is finding out? So if we come back to a very simple concept of uh, a very young child, if you take a, a, a very young child who has a good relationship with its mother or father, any parent, you will see that the child will use one hand to hold on to the parent. And while it's holding on to the parent with the other arm and its little feet, it'll go and explore the world. But as soon as it lets go of mom or dad, it suddenly feels frightened and it needs to come back. So it's balancing the worst possible outcome, which is a come back to mom or dad. Whatever the worst outcome is, that certainty is there. So it's that certainty with the uncertainty of what there is to explore. There is a human need to have a curiosity gap. There are lots of great psychologists who have written about how if we were to sit in a cave with absolutely no uncertainty around us, we would all go mad. So we have evolved to need there to be some uncertainty around us, some element of surprise around us. A uh, curiosity gap is what drives us to learn. And I'm going to bring in another uh, angle to this, which is I mentioned how when the brain starts feeling more and more uh, alert and vigilant and then more prepared for uncertainty, you have this burst of lots and lots of neurotransmitters going through it. And this takes the brain through a state where your performance is optimal and peak until you tip over. Now, just at that point before you tip over, there is ample evidence now to suggest that the brain actually physically becomes more pliable, which means that all the patterns, all the learned information it has suddenly become easier to unlearn and let go. There is a great experiment which has not been talked about recently because if there are lots of little caveats to it, but, but the experiment uh, essentially translates as the following. If you take a goat, I'm just giving you a random example, eating on a patch of grass and you, you stimulate a certain particular part of the brain. So you increase the amount of a particular set of neurotransmitters, in this case, noradrenaline. The goat, which is very happily chewing on its patch of grass, will suddenly want to release its patch of grass and go exploring for new patches of grass without there being any change. So it's not that it has less grass to chew on. It's not that it's not hungry. Nothing has changed. All that has changed is the particular neurotransmitter combination in its brain. And at the point where this happens, the brain actually in a real world context, as I said, becomes very pliable. So it moves from going from a very rule-based routine system to one where it's suddenly open to learn. So it's prepared to let go of what it knows, to suddenly go into a new terrain and think, okay, hang on, the old rules don't work anymore. I'm supposed to have new rules. What are these new rules? I'm going to start with a blank slate. This state of the brain is what keeps the brain healthy and young 
and reduces the consequences of aging because as it learns, it grows more connections. And we know now that plasticity in the brain, stimulation of the brain is what keeps it young. So when the mind is in a situation where you are in a state of high vigilance, but not quite stress, or even acute stress, but definitely not chronic stress, your brain is in that extremely moldable form for it to pick up new information, new data, new rules, and for it to really thrive, but more importantly, for it to be able to adapt to change, which is the reason for our existence. So we need there to be a challenge. We need there to be a curiosity gap. We need there to be uncertainty because that's what drives adaptation. That's what keeps the brain young. Now, that drive comes from within. So your brain has to think you need to adapt to this. This is a challenge worth striving for. But if you are living within a realm, within a situation where the adaptation gaps, where the challenges that you are encountering are not aligned with the challenges that you feel inside, that are not aligned with your own identity, that are not aligned with what you like doing, then that rather than becoming an opportunity to learn and be curious and grow, you become like the child who withdraws from the world and goes back to the mother or father. You no longer want to grow, but instead you just want to keep practicing and keep doing what you're doing and hone that skill. So there is a point where you have to let go and you have to feel comfortable with the uncertainty of going into a new terrain with completely new rules. And it's certainly the case that when people become hyper-specialized or they, become, they start doing what they're really good at for too long and too intensely, even though they're really good at it, that the opportunity for novelty, the opportunity for the flexibility to adapt to a completely new terrain starts becoming a little more constricted. And as soon as that happens, the great potential for growth, both in a metaphorical sense and in a literal sense, starts becoming more and more constrained. So that balance has to be there. So when you're starting off and when you're setting off your own challenges, you are driven by something that's very aligned with your core needs, your core values, your core dreams and ambitions, which are positive. But at some point, you start making the switch to, to filling the adaptation gap, not because you're striving for something positive, but because you're trying to prevent something negative. And that then turns into a situation that stifles growth. It makes so much sense. It's immensely powerful because it aligns with so much of what's happening in my life in so many ways. And it also resonates so powerfully with what was happening in my life, undoubtedly, to take something and to not to necessarily overdo it, but to overdo it in the same way over and over again. And to stop exploring what's at the base of it, because at the base of that performance is me. And if I keep exploring me, I can go in all these different directions. And the more I find there, the more it adds to my performance. But the more I focus on just what I'm doing without exploring the me, you come to an end. There's only so much of it you can do before it becomes a chore, before it becomes a duty. Uh, and like you said, in, in, and then it becomes survival. For me, the exact way of describing it would be at some point I switched from being, I want to find out all I can be to, I think I've got enough now and I want to get through this with what I've got versus I want whatever this is to reveal more of me. And I think that's the space of almost intending deeply, as you mentioned, with that imagination, with that dreaming state, that real embodying it to such an extent, as you said, that the body doesn't know the difference between whether you're doing it or whether you're just imagining it. You're so deep into it. Just really feel that unbound imagination. Sometimes I think in the space I was in and the environments I was involved in, professional rugby and all these things, a lot of stuff about you've got to learn from your mistakes and it's very formulaic. And what you end up doing is, is it becomes like a test. 
rather than it becoming a case of somehow create, as you mentioned within that relationship, a confidence and a trust in the person to just go and explore. When you go into a space where you don't have a percentage guarantee of how it's going to turn out, you just go and it's in that next step that you perform something. When it's not premeditated, you make the first decision and then you say, right, I'm going to allow whatever happens in that space. And I think committing to just going out into the field was exactly that, to say, I'm going to go out there and then I'm going to allow. And what happens is amazing. But I think as I got later on in my career, it was I was on the field still trying to own the next step and to own that transformation. You're talking about that adaptation. I felt like I was saying, and maybe this is exactly what you're saying, yes, I'm going to adapt, but I want to control my adaptation rather than I will let my adaptation be the adaptation required according to my intention. And if I know what that already is, I should be there already. So I have to assume if I, if I have something I really want and desire and it's not here, the gap you're talking about is the gap I have to open up to. Does that sound about right? It sounds completely right. And I'm also going to bring in the idea of the flow state, which I'm sure you would have experienced. Yeah. And it's it's synonymous with peak performance, but the flow state is also applied or it can be experienced outside of outside of sport. And I think what's very interesting is the the flow state, which we still don't know we still don't completely understand it because obviously it's very difficult to put someone in a flow state when they're in an MRI machine. <laughs> it's the, the least conducive to it. But, but that state of mind, from what I've read of the research, I think it's very interesting that you can only get into that state if you satisfy a few very, very critical criteria. One of those criteria is the need for a challenge and that need for challenge has to be large enough so as to surpass your confidence, at least for the first couple of times. So from your description of going onto a field, you need to be able to go onto that field not knowing 100%. You might know it 40%, 50%, 60%, 60%, but you won't know 100% exactly what is going to happen to you. There has to be that gap. It mustn't be zero. So it mustn't, the challenge mustn't be so great that everything hits you like a lorry. It has to be controlled to a degree, but there has to be that degree of open space because that open space produces that drive in your brain for a curiosity gap, for an adaptation gap. That has to be there. And when you satisfy that by bringing your skills up, to close that gap, that satisfaction of closing a gap you did not anticipate is one of the key triggers that puts you into this state. Because you described earlier how if you rehearse a situation too much and you go onto the field, the satisfaction isn't quite as great as there would be were there that tiny gap of the unknown where you have rehearsed, but you still go out into that field and yet you're able to bring your skills up to the level to close that gap. And then you do it again. And then you do it again throughout the game. So there's always this little gap that has to be there. And closing that gap with your skills requires your brain to grow in a metaphorical sense, but also in an actual sense, because you are learning even if it, you've re rehearsed something many times, if there has been a challenge gap, you are learning to close that gap. So even the slightest permutation of an expected trajectory causes your brain to learn to close that gap. And so before you're on the pitch, it's all in your imagination. But once you're on the pitch, you are creating this challenge feedback, challenge feedback loop. And that challenge has to be great enough for you to get the feedback that you can achieve it. Because if you don't give yourself the opportunity to overcome a challenge, which by definition cannot be known 100%, you are not giving your brain, yourself, the feedback signal that you are alive. 
One of the quote, I can't remember who said it, but it really sits with me, especially when I think of flow and the state of peak performance is, don't find something that you're good at or that makes you money or that makes you successful. Find what makes you feel alive. And that feeling alive is synonymous with closing that gap by bringing your skills up a notch, by learning on the spot, because at that moment, you have suddenly turned the world, which is an unrestrained puppet, into your own puppet so that you suddenly control the strings. And that is a very powerful feeling as a human being, because at that point, whether you're on the pitch, whether you're somewhere else, you have become an agent of your world. That's great. I, I love the idea also of, of that when you're pulling those strings, you're pulling them in the moment. They're not strings that you've pulled beforehand with your preparation. And then in the moment, you just sit back because the work's done. It, it, it's the pulling in the moment. And you don't, you can't have that guarantee that you are going to pull them perfectly in order to experience that aliveness. There has to be that edge of, you know, what, I don't know. And if you remove it from me, like we used to say, I used to have this almost technique before a game. I'd, I'd imagine this this sort of angel from the future coming back and I'd be able to say, you know, how does the game go? Does it go okay? Do we win? Yeah, and, and do I get everything right? And it'd be sort of like, yeah, yeah, you, you do. It's all good. And if you sign here on this contract, you get all that. You just don't get to play the game. And suddenly you're thinking, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get rid of that game part here. And actually in the state I was in of that anxiety, most of the time I probably would have signed the contract. Then you'd be sat with your win thinking, this isn't the point. This isn't feeling alive. A lot of what you're talking about for me is it's really exciting. And from personal experience, when I've had crises moments and it's involved periods of st strong anxiety and depression and you know, great fear and conflict and what have you, but there's been an aliveness to it. And what's been interesting is that, that in that space, exactly the same as in the change room before a game, you want rid of it, but you also know you don't. And it's that challenge. And when you're over the edge of it, you just want want it gone because it's just it's just too much and, and totally understandable. And everyone has their different sort of experiences of this. But for me, there are those moments. And there's those other moments where it represents the perfect level of challenge to say, right, what is the challenge? The challenge isn't to go out there and try and solve the anxiety. The challenge is to sit, as you mentioned, in that vulnerable space and allow it. And the sitting is the skill <laughs> and where I haven't in my previous time it certainly wasn't one of my skills was to sit with unrest it would be to go out and physically solve it to mentally and logically calculate and deduce the answer and from an emotional perspective it'd be to just remind myself the whole time that it's, it's okay to, whatever it was but to sit quietly and observe is an incredible skill and there comes a point where that skill like you said you just sit and it starts to make sense briefly and this is what I'm going to say now which is quite sort of interesting for me to say it out loud is that there are times when that period of anxiety would gently move away and I needed it back because it became a great pointer to where my next area of growth was. Without it, you try and create that purpose, but so much of the purpose becomes just a physical feat, which is great, but it, it doesn't reveal, like I said before, the key element of the performance is that it's me performing. So if I can get to more of me, I can get to more of the performance. And in those moments of crisis, emotional and mental and what have you, the challenge is there constantly. And so there's this massive meeting of a challenge for such a consistent and continuous period that real growth comes out of it. And after every crisis moment, you look back and say, I'm so different in many ways, but so much more responsible for me, I feel because of that challenge. Whereas the other challenges, which may be more on a physical level, have been great in that I've got these physical skills, but I don't feel it's revealed that much more of the, of the deeper potential, if you know what I mean. Well, the mental challenge that you talk about, when your mind is in this state where it has entered a state of anxiety, of hypervigilance, hyper-responsivity, and there's this surge of noradrenaline going through your brain. You're under a state of high physiological arousal, cortical arousal. That point is the point where you essentially become human because you become 
an agent in a world you have to bring under your control. Before that, you are simply swimming with the known, even if it's a physical feat. But at that point, your brain is recalibrating itself. So there is data that you need to be in a state of high arousal for your brain to make this surge of connections. And we know that acute stress, it results in a surge of these neurotrophic molecules, these these chemicals that increase new connections, that increase, in fact, even increase the growth of brain cells in, in animals. So that state of the of the brain where you mentally feel you are out of control and you need to make sense of everything is your brain trying to do just that. So one of the, I think one of the mistakes that we, we make is we live in a way in, you know, especially in our Western um, societies, in our urbanized society. So not in a really natural hunter gatherer in line with evolution society, rather a sterile, you know, artificial environment. We've created a situation where there is too much safety. Okay. We have our food is sterile. It's guaranteed. Our homes are sterile. We're not attacked by anything. Everything around us, as we have become more and more industrialized and, and developed, we have reduced uncertainty. So we are constantly in a state of constant safety. And if you go to some hunter gatherer communities, which are still thriving today, whether in uh, South America, whether in Africa, whether in India, you will find people who are not experiencing that sense of safety. So our sense of perpetual safety is has become second nature, which is why when we feel uncomfortable, when the brain feels uncomfortable, when our minds feel uncomfortable, for us that's a cause of alarm. But acute stress and this sudden pressure, as long as it doesn't become chronic, these acute bursts of feeling as if really you need to bring the world under control, but there is this gap and your brain is struggling to understand everything. That is one of the central tenets of being human and of existing and of growing and of surviving and of adapting. So that feeling which we have now grown to associate as negative is actually a positive thing. So when we feel it, we need to start embracing it. Because if it is not there and we live a life that is very, very uh, stable, very, very sterile, then when we do have a situation that requires immediate adaptation, we struggle. So being in that zone, feeling that feeling is an incredibly important part of our existence. And just to divert a little bit from this, um, there is now quite a lot of data coming from studies, which actually we should have done all this time, but we're only just doing, of people, for instance, like the Tsimani population in South America, who, for instance, you know, still have a hunter-gatherer existence. So they have this constant, not threat, but this constant need to maintain their own survival. And they live in a way that is so far removed from the way we live. And yet, so many studies are suggesting that their brain health is so much better than ours. There are also other studies come emerging from other hunter-gatherer populations that suggest that these very quick, short bursts of sudden feeling like that, not just physically, but emotionally and mentally, can actually bring benefits in the long run. So we've, we have created a lifestyle that sees this feeling as being toxic or harmful when actually it's it's very important for brain growth and the fact that you say you feel good in that situation and you always come out of that feeling you have learnt or you have grown or you have advanced is actually evidence that that's what it does so when you look at trauma as an isolated uh, topic there is something known as post traumatic growth which is now being more and more widely studied in the populations in China and in Japan after the natural disaster, so the earthquake and the tsunami. And there is definitely evidence that people who come through trauma, 
and who do the right thing so that they actually remove themselves from the physiological state of the actual trauma itself. They recover physically. They certainly have a psychological tendency for greater resilience. And we talked about wisdom and wonder earlier. I think with age or with life experience, you're exposed to more and more situations of being in an unknown situation, having an adaptation gap, and learning that actually this adaptation gap is comfortable, can be made comfortable, should be accepted, and can lead to a good outcome afterwards. Which is why, again, there are some, but there's some light size that show that people who are older do have better tolerance for these stressful situations. So becoming comfortable with uncertainty and feeling in that zone and accepting it can bring huge benefits. Oh, I'm really amazed by that because it's opening up quite a few things in me. The idea for me, when you're tipped over in that survival mode, beauty and love and connection and, and inspiration and intuition in, in that kind of, they're not really relevant to a state that is just saying, I have to, I have to stay alive in this space. Like you said, how can you have growth and just get through this and grow at the same time if it's in that real, and I spent a lot of time in that state where I just wanted to feel that kind of joy of life and it wasn't there. And yet tip it back a little bit. And there's so much in that purposeful moment of challenge and of real intention and, and commitment I think the point for me being that my experience has been, like I said before, I've almost had this self-importance idea about I've had success and this is what's got me there. So this is what needs to stay and swallow up all the challenge. Instead of being able to let go and say, let's begin a new, I had four years of injury and I had four years of injury because after the first one, I probably needed to say something along the lines of, let's just take a whole year out and start again. As it was, I, all I could think of was I have to get back straight to where I was and what I was doing. So another injury, I had 14 injuries in a row for four years, five, six, seven operations, whatever it was. And I couldn't work it out apart from the fact that I just couldn't let go of, I already had the answer and the answer had to win over the challenge. But what I guess what I'm reading from this is that deep down there's an intention for this growth, for this for this joy of life, to become more of me, to know a bit more about who I'm supposed to be. And that challenge is pointing me in that direction. But me saying, no, no, I just want to stay as I am, is in conflict with the intention of who I want to be. And I've got to let go of what I've already got in order to let the adaptation, which isn't what I already sort of have learned, otherwise I'd have it. I feel like there's been a real value. There's been one where the, the answer has always been not to gather a new understanding, but to let go of an old one and to shed something so that I can, because it feels almost to have stress, you must have a hard line somewhere for there to be friction. So it's actually harder to unlearn than it is to learn okay. when you're an adult. All right. That, that makes so much sense with, I've lived in France for a while and I watched young children trying to learn a language because they weren't trying to compare it to whatever language they had versus adults who were trying to do it all through the logic they'd already got and it was taking forever. And yeah, within about six months, kids were speaking fluent French or whatever it was. It's beautiful. A hundred percent. I live in Luxembourg and I've been, I've learned Luxembourgish, but in order to learn Luxembourgish, I had to unlearn some of the rules of German. Yeah, okay. And it's like, you know, it's starting, it's like having a blank slate. Once you've drawn on it, it's much harder to erase that than writing on it for the first time. So because unlearning is so difficult, your idea of yourself becomes more and more defined as you grow older. And you receive information about yourself through many different channels. So one of the most potent information data givers about yourself are other people. Okay, so you look at other people's eyes the, your eyes point outwards. The only time they point inwards is when you look in a mirror. So your eyes gauge yourself from the reaction of other people's eyes and other people's responses to you. And your idea of yourself is formed partly from this kind of input coming from outside you, which is beyond your control because you cannot control the social world around you. And that is actually a very, very potent stressor because socio-evaluative threat is a very, very important 
source of threat in the kind of world, urbanized world we live today. So that, that is one input to your sense of self. Another input of your sense of self comes from the inside, comes from how you are as an agent in your world. How can you bring the rest of the world under your control? How can you bring your environment under control? What can you do? Mastery. How can you master a challenge? So mastering a challenge consistently, which in your case has been exponential, is one way of innately creating sense of yourself. Now, I would guess, and correct me if I'm wrong, but in your case, these two have merged together. And your sense of self, because you stay in the same environment, which is your sport and the people around you relating to your sport and your profession, your sense of yourself is constantly defined and defined and solidified and turned into stone. So when you had your injuries, that suddenly created this big break certainly between your your innate sense of self and what you can do. So your innate sense of self says, you know, you can go and win a championship, but your injury says, no, right now you can't walk. So that's a gap. But perhaps more importantly, you can resolve that gap by healing, by recovering in your own private space. But if you have an expectation around you and you have an expectation gap there, that becomes very difficult to deal with because the people's perception and your global perception of, of you is not under your control. And I think the danger that we fall into, that many people fall into, is that having this consistent definition of self coming from external cues versus your innate cues of feeling alive. So when you're in that situation of being in under intense mental duress, where you are anxious, but it feels like you are living, you feel alive and you miss that feeling when you're not there. That is you finding yourself. That is you feeling yourself. Whereas when other people say, oh, you are this, this is who you are, you've done, you know, had these extraordinary achievements and you will do this, that has nothing to do with your own ability to change the world, to touch the world, to make things happen because you cannot control other people's perception of you. Well, yeah, it's, it's definitely falls into place with my practice at the moment, which is becoming aware, as you mentioned, of that feeling realm. And a lot of that feeling triggered by old habits of needing to be a certain way or, or be seen in a certain way. And then bringing up the awareness of that feeling realm and then being able to, as you mentioned, welcome it, almost lovingly embrace it, explore it, rather than what I've always done, which is try to resolve it or prove something from it. And therefore, in a way, what I found really powerful is that when I was playing rugby, the only thing I was really, really into was my rugby. It was, it was so absorbing that when I wasn't playing rugby, it was a bit of a flat line, or, or at least that's the way I, I made it because I put so much importance on the rugby. But now being interested in potential and, and growth means that there's that opportunity the rugby game is on the whole time but not tipped over to that oh life's so stressful but in that space of there's always something to be engaged in working on and then becoming more aware of the the more subtle dimensions of that feeling so there's always something there to be worked on even on days where you sit down you're doing exactly the same thing you did the, the day before but there isn't that kind of, oh, God, we're doing that again tomorrow, are we? Oh, no. It's like, okay, like you said, that little bit of unknown is still there. Who knows what it's going to be? And challenging that old me, but to come back to that, let's just see. I had a massive fascination with a few guys I played with in changing rooms who, who were able to say, yeah, we've done the work. Let's just see how it goes. And I said, but no, it doesn't make sense. How can you say that? You know, what if it goes wrong? They're kind of like, well, let's just see how it goes. And I think that's the beauty of every day now is to be able to say, let's just see why, because it's not about the external. Yeah, it can be the same environment, but if I'm brand new and I'm new to it, it's so engaging. And also I know there's always going to be things coming up that allow me to fall deeper and deeper into that space of potential. And I wonder if 
for you is is there with everything you've you've written in your your stress proof book and all the research you've done and everything that's going on what's what's daily life like for you in a in a conscious practice sense how much does that cross over the individual to the professional side on this how much of it for you is about actually daily having a a plan as you say so i've uh, done lots of different things over the last uh, four decades of my life <laughs> and i think I certainly learned several lessons. So I was in before I'm, so I'm in Luxembourg, as I explained. I, I live here now, but I was in Hong Kong for 10 years. Um, and before that, I was in London. And I was also doing different jobs. So in, as you know, from, from what I described, and I think what I've learned personally from writing my book and from living life in general is really a reinforcement of what I said, which is your sense of self which is most sustainable, which isn't just sustainable for a short period of time or temporarily, is one which remains sustained despite the world changing. So having a sort of flexibility on the outside, but a consistency on the inside. The whole concept of stress and the reason we've evolved to have a stress response, as I said at the start, it's bridging an adaptation gap. And adaptation is one of the most, it's probably the most important facet of our existence as human beings. If we don't adapt, no matter how strong we are, how clever we are, how attractive we are, whatever, how rich we are, we will fail. Because in any point in time, the only thing you can control is yourself. You have an illusion of control beyond that, but that's where your control ends. So it's remaining constant through change. That is the point of our physiological and mental stress response. And if you take this across a person's lifespan, there is now a lot of data that part of the brain that allows for cognitive flexibility is also a determinant of healthy brain aging. When people develop neurodegenerative conditions such as dementia, one of the first things to go is the ability to be cognitively flexible. So I think coming back to your question, I don't like to give out kind of single bits of advice, but generally speaking, I think being very open and relaxed in face of change has allowed me to stifle my stress response. So keep it in the right zone, so not tip it over to beyond anxiety when I encounter change. And having that, in addition to never being afraid of completely and drastically changing my environment, drastically doing new things, is I think possibly the most important thing that sustains me and that has sustained me over, over my entire life. Wow. Quite a few times during this conversation, you've mentioned about feeling alive and, and that really fascinates me because quite often you hear people talking about living in the now and making the most of this moment and making the most of life and living it fully and all these kind of expressions, you know, living a great life. But when it comes down to it, for me, there is only this moment and you can have, as I had at times in my life, won everything I wanted. But if I'm having a bad day and someone says, how's life? I'm like, it's terrible. <laughs> I don't say it's terrible now, but I've had a great time up until this because I've won loads of stuff. I'm just, no, it's terrible. And if I've had a terrible day, but actually I, I'm just suddenly I've, I've hit that point where I, I'm really appreciative and grateful of everything I've got. They say, how's life? So it's amazing. And, and I wonder for you, what's your view on making the most of the moment? How do you see that kind of opportunity? I'm very influenced by one of my favorite countries, which is, which is Japan, and the culture over there of taking the simple and the mundane and giving yourself an unenforced challenge of making that simple and that mundane the most extraordinary thing in the universe. So I, I give you a little anecdote. Cleaning a train is the most boring thing. Well, for me, it would be a mm. boring thing. It can be a very boring thing for many people, okay? So when the Japanese bullet train, the Shinkansen, started out, and when uh, Japanese railways had their team of cleaners, it was not the most exciting job in the world. And so there was a lot of 
talk and a lot of discussion as to how to make it better and, and more appealing to workers and so on. If you fast forward, if you go to you know, Tokyo Station, you're waiting to board the Shinkansen bullet train. Honestly, it is the most extraordinary experience, at least it was for me, because you're waiting outside, the train arrives, the passengers leave, the cleaners start off by bowing to the train. They then enter the train and they do what looks like a magical dance that you can see from the window, where they clean every single spot on the train in a beautiful, coordinated, you know, refined set of movements. I think within a space of, I'm, I'm, I can't remember what the time is, but something like you know, three minutes or something. And then they leave and the train is absolutely spick and span. And then they stand outside and then they bow. Now, that whole ceremony, first of all, creates optimal performance in the cleaners because I've never been on trains which are that clean. Mm -hmm. Second, it's done in an, at an extraordinary speed. But the third most important thing is that you can see by the cleaners' eyes how incredibly fulfilled they feel and proud they feel and alive they feel every time they do it. And, you know, this exists in, in every aspect of Japanese culture that I've personally, you know, encountered. I've been to a pizza place where they just do two types of pizzas, but the chef has been perfecting this one type of basic pizza for 30 years until it's so exquisite that it just cannot be improved. So coming back to your question, how do you live in the moment? I think you cannot predict the moment on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, because life means you are going to be encountering novelty consistently. If that were not the case, we might as well all be dead, quite literally. Yeah. Now, what that moment presents at any particular time is finite from the outside, but it's infinite from your point of view. So you could be a train cleaner, but you could spend as much time and give as much thought and as much energy to making your part of that job the most extraordinary you can ever imagine. And I think for me, the philosophy of, of living in the moment, which, which can sometimes sound like a little bit of a cliche, is really that. It is really optimizing your current situation to use as many of your resources and your skill and your talent to make the simplest things extraordinary so that every moment in your day, you cannot just pass off. You can fill with an extraordinary experience of feeling alive. Now, this is my philosophy. I'm not going to say to you that every moment of my day I feel alive, but that's one way in which you can view your daily mundane tasks where it is possible to do whatever you are doing in a way that takes you to your best level. And, you know, flow, of course, comes into it too, because when Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, the person who named Flow Flow, who sadly passed away recently, in his book on flow, he describes how factory workers doing the most mundane assembly line jobs actually set themselves challenges. So they say, okay, I'm going to fit these pieces today in about two thirds of the time that I did yesterday, or I'm going to find the best way to do it. And they set themselves challenges. No one else is aware that they're setting themselves these challenges, but they are. And that is creating for them eight hours of a mundane assembly line job is transformed into eight hours of challenge and feedback and expressing yourself and bringing things under your control and hence of feeling alive and living in the moment. Amazing. That You mentioned there just that infinite that I think is in the potential side of who we really are. And when we access that, whatever we're doing, if the infinite it has been engaged, you just see an effortless grace about it, an engagement, and it's inspiring. Not because anyone's telling you little slogans or motivational quotes, or it's just inspiring to see full engagement taking place. And it's especially inspiring, like you said, when it, it's in an area which many might consider to be just a mundane type of job or movement or doing the washing up. But when you see someone with, with even if it not be an all smile type of joy, but the joyful engagement of just 
of involving themselves fully at that level. I think that for me really describes or at least opens the door to a, a lot of what I'm trying to sort of uncover with this potential side of things. And it's not about what the outside looks like. People think, what is human potential? And we think about futuristic sci-fi films and all these kind of things going on and people that can manifest stuff out of nothing and, and do these amazing feats. But actually the potential we're talking about that has no limit is, is accessible right now. And it's, it's really inspiring. Thank you so much, Dr. Mitu Storoni, for all of your input, for all of your wisdom, wisdom that's certainly not closing doors like mine did for a while, but it is certainly opening a huge amount and making a difference to so many people's lives around the world. I wish you all the best with everything you're doing, especially with your book, with Stress Proof, and I'm sure it's having an influence and an impact everywhere. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a real honor. Thank you for having me. And just like that, we're at the end of another episode of I Am. I'm so, so grateful to all of you for listening in. I'm enormously keen that this be a two-way conversation. So if you've got any thoughts, questions, ideas, anything that's been inspired by these conversations, anything you just want to get off your chest and get out there, then please send them across in the reviews or just get in touch on social media. I absolutely love holding these types of discussions. I do believe there is no more powerful an opportunity in life than to look at what we can make of our time here on earth, individually and collectively. There's so much scope and depth in these conversations and all the learnings and lessons I do feel are limitless. If you haven't already, and you want to know a little bit more about why I'm holding this space and talking to these guests, then do head over to the Tuesday episodes. There I'll explain my journey and my history with these people. I'll also use this time to answer any of your questions, so don't hesitate to get in touch, and I'd love it if you'd rate, review, follow, and subscribe to the show. Until next week, have a great weekend. Thanks for listening to I Am with me, Johnny Wilkinson. This show is brought to you by Max Creative. The executive producer is Megan Hill-Smith, and our editor is Kit Milsom.